Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our first webinar of this fall entitled Climate Change and Harmful Algal Blooms in Lake Erie. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, Bird Polar Research Center, and six other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. My name is Christina Diakis from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today are Molly Willowson and Dr. Rick Stumpf. Molly Willowson is the Extension Climatologist for the Midwestern Regional Climate Center in Illinois, Indiana Sea Grant, where she communicates climate-related information across the region, including historical climate analysis, climate change communication, K-12 education, and climate adaptation. Dr. Stump is an oceanographer at NOAA with 30 years of experience in investigating habitat and eutrophication problems of the U.S. coast and Great Lakes. He uses satellite data and models to address algal bloom monitoring and forecasting and leads NOAA's effort to translate research into operational forecasts of harmful algal blooms. We're delighted to have these great speakers here today to discuss harmful algal blooms and climate change. But before we get started, a few logistical issues. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, at about 12.40 or 12.45, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll collect and pose your questions to the speakers at the end of the presentation. We have more than 500 people registered on this webinar. Um, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature towards the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey, since it will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without any further delay, I would like to introduce Molly Willowson and Dr. Rick Stump, who will present climate change and harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie. Um, Molly, I will make you the presenter, and you should be able to get started. All right, thank you. Oops, let me get back to the first slide. All right, thank you. Well, as Christina said, my name is Molly Willowson, and I am the Extension Climatologist for the Midwestern Regional Climate Center and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. And I'm sorry, I'm just getting over a cold if I have to stop, and I'm sorry if I cough or need to take a drink, but hopefully I'll be able to get through the 20 minutes or so. Um, but before Dr. Stump talks to you today about harmful algal blooms, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the historical climate trends in the Lake Erie Basin. And then we'll take a look at what climate models may be predicting for the future in this region. Sorry, one second. Okay, so before we look at the data, it's very important when you're talking about climate trends to distinguish between climate variability and climate change. Year to year and even decade to decade, the climate of a location will naturally fluctuate, and this is called climate variability. Climatic variables like temperature and precipitation will fluctuate in how they depart from some average state, whether it's above or below the long-term average. The graph on the right shows the year-to-year -year variability in annual precipitation for the Lake Erie Basin. One example of this year-to-year -year variability is around 1950, where you see the two red circles. That shows that one year there was record high precipitation, followed by the very next year, which was near record low precipitation. On the other hand, when we're talking about climate change, we're looking for patterns that represent a long-term and persistent shift in the climate on the order of several decades or more, like this figure on the left that shows a steady increase in above normal low temperatures across the United States since the 1970s. So today we're going to look at four different climate variables, temperature, precipitation, lake levels, and ice cover, to see what kind of changes have been observed since the early 1900s for the Lake Erie Basin. Then we'll talk about climate models and what they're predicting for future changes for these variables and what impacts these changes may have on Lake Erie. First, let's look at annual temperature trends since 1895 for the Lake Erie Basin. 
This data is coming from land stations on the U.S. side of the lake. And just a quick explanation of the graph itself. The blue line represents the average temperature each year. So for example, the average temperature in 2012, which is on the far side of, far right side of the graph, was about 52 degrees Fahrenheit. The red line, on the other hand, is the 11-year moving average. <clears throat> the moving average line is added to the figure to remove some of the noise that's associated with the natural variability in temperature from year to year. This line should help you see the overall trend in the data a little bit better. This figure shows that since the early 1970s, there has been a fairly steady increasing trend in temperature, which is comparable to what temperature data shows for the United States as a whole warmer temperatures since 1970. The warmest year on record was 1998 when the average temperature was 52.1 degrees Fahrenheit. Last year, 2012, came in very close to beating that record, however, just barely missing it by a few hundredths of a degree. There was also a year in the early 1920s that came in very close as well as to one of the warmest years on record for this region. So from this graph, you can also see that temperatures in the region today are pretty comparable to what we saw in the 1930s and 1950s. Cooler periods in the historical record were in the late 1800s to early 1900s, and also the 60s and 70s. So what do temperature scenarios look like for the future? Well, as I'm sure many of you know, climate models are predicting warmer temperatures, but by how much? So this figure is based on information provided by a technical report for the 2013 National Climate Assessment. The left column of figures represents a high emission scenario, whereas the right column represents a lower emission scenario for carbon dioxide. The top set of figures shows projections for the near future, the middle is mid-century, and then finally the bottom set of figures is representing the end of the century temperature projections. So let's look at the high emission scenarios in the left column. So in the near future, temperatures may only be about two and a half to three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they are today on average. However, by the end of the century, which is this bottom left figure, climate models are predicting this region could be seven and a half to eight and a half degrees warmer on average. What about breaking it down by season? Are climate models anticipating even warming among all seasons? Well, what climate models are showing right now is that it's anticipated temperatures may warm the most in the summer months, which is the bottom left figure, possibly about five to five and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the Lake Erie Basin. And this is by mid-century. The least amount of warming is expected in the spring season, possibly about three and a half to four degrees warmer than today. So what would this warming mean for the Great Lakes? Well, warmer atmospheric temperatures would also mean warmer surface temperatures for the water as well. By mid-century, under both a high and low emission scenarios, temperatures at the surface of the lakes are expected to be anywhere from 2.7 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average than they are today. Warmer lake temperatures also have other impacts, like reducing the extent and duration of wintertime ice cover on the lake. And finally, as surface temperatures warm, it is expected that warming will initiate earlier in the spring and they'll cool off later in the fall season. Therefore, there could be a deeper and stronger thermal stratification in the lakes during the summer months. Now let's take a look at annual precipitation. And once again, for this figure, we are looking at data for the Lake Erie Basin, and the blue line represents total precipitation for each individual year, while the red line is the 11-year moving average. So precipitation in the Lake Erie Basin has ranged from only just over 24 inches in the driest year to over 52 inches in the wettest year, which was 2011. 2011 is definitely a year that stands out in terms of precipitation for the region. It broke the previous annual precipitation record by over six inches. The trend in precipitation is pretty obvious when you look at this figure. Total annual precipitation has been on an upward trend. In fact, if you look at the 30-year climate normals, meaning an average of 30 years of data, the most recent normal from the last three decades of 1981 to 2010 is four and a half inches greater than the annual norm normal from the early 1900s. And this increase in the 30-year normal was consistent throughout the, throughout the century. It is, of course, uncertain how this trend will continue over the next few decades. Will we continue to see an increase in annual precipitation or not? 
Some climate projections are indicating that total annual precipitation in the Lake Erie Basin may not change drastically from what it is today. However, what may change in terms of precipitation is how intense the events are, meaning how much um, rain falls during each event. So let's take a look at extreme precipitation and, and see if there's already been any changes, both in terms of heavy precipitation and drought. So the data on this slide is showing us whether there's been a change in the frequency of large storm events, which are defined as storms that produce one inch of precipitation or greater. And in this figure, the blue bars are representing events prior to 1970, whereas the red bars are representing the events after 1970 until today. The first set of bars here on the left represents events that measure one inch to 1.49 inches of precipitation. The second set is 1.5 to 1.99, and so on until the far right, which are events measuring three inches or greater. So this first graph that we're looking at is showing Sandusky, Ohio's data, which is in the Western Lake Erie Basin. So this data shows us that since the 1970s, there have been a greater frequency of large storm events, with the majority of the red bars being greater than the blue bars. The only exception are events that actually measure over three inches where there has been a slight decrease. And even though it's not shown here, Sandusky has been receiving fewer smaller storms, which are storms producing less than a half of, of an inch of precipitation. So to represent the whole basin, let's look at a location on the eastern side of the lake, um, which is Erie, Pennsylvania. And the results for Erie are very similar. There has been a greater frequency of large storm events producing over one inch of precipitation, especially if you look here in the storms producing one to 1.49 inches, there has been a significant increase. The only exception in this case is storms producing two and a half to 2.99 inches, which have decreased slightly. So overall, the Lake Erie Basin has been receiving a higher frequency of storms that produce one inch of precipitation or more. So now moving on to the other side of the spectrum, droughts are also part of the Lake Erie Basin's past and present climate, and most likely future climate as well. And droughts can have a major impact on the basin, especially in terms of agriculture. The figure shows the halt drought, drought severity index value starting in 1895 for the Lake Erie Basin. The PDSI uses temperature and rainfall information in, the for, in a formula to determine dryness. The red values on the figure represent drought conditions, while the blue indicate the, the opposite. The driest time on record in this region is from April 1930 to March 1931, which is reflected by the lowest values here on the PDSI scale. Other times of severe drought in this region include the late 1800s, throughout the 1930s, the 1950s, and also the 1960s. So looking at this figure, you can see that definitely we have seen less frequent and less severe droughts in recent decades, especially when we're looking at the start of the 21st century. So what are climate models predicting for the future in terms of precipitation? So the latest set of climate models used for the 2013 National Climate Assessment indicate that precipitation in this region may increase slightly in the future, but the annual changes may not be that drastic. So this figure shows the difference in precipitation in the future from a base period of the last three decades. The top set of figures once again represents the near future projections, the middle is mid-century, and then finally the bottom set of figures is the end of the century projections. And the left column is the high emission scenario, and the right column is the lower emission scenario for carbon dioxide. So even if we look at the late century high emission scenario, the projections show that the annual precipitation for the Lake Erie Basin is only about three to 6% greater than today, which equates to about one to two inches more on average per year. But what about seasonal differences? Do models predict that there will be a slight increase in all seasons? Well, models currently show that the greatest increase in precipitation might happen in the winter season, which is the top left, with possibly the region receiving 10 to 15% more precipitation than today in the winter. And spring also is the second season that we might see more, maybe about five to, five to 10 percent more than today. On the other hand, the one season that's expected to be drier is summer, maybe five to 10 percent less than we are receiving today. So what are climate models predicting in terms of extreme precipitation in the future? 
So as the previous slide indicated, there may not be a significant change in total annual precipitation. However, climate models are predicting that we may see more extreme precipitation, both in terms of heavy precipitation and drought. This figure is showing model simulations for the number of days with precipitation greater than one inch. And the model output is showing that for the Lake Erie Basin, we may experience 10 to 30% more days with precipitation greater than one inch by mid-century. So what are some of the possible impacts on the Great Lakes based on these precipitation projections that we just discussed? Well, with more precipitation possibly falling in the winter and spring, this may increase sediment and nutrient loadings into the Great Lakes, which could increase algal bloom frequency and also lower the overall lake water quality. Also, if storms become more intense and more frequent in the future, this could increase the risk for coastal flooding as well as accelerate beach, shore, and bluff erosion. So now let's move on to the Lake Erie variables, um, the first of which is water levels. So this figure shows that water levels on Lake Erie have been quite variable over the period of record, which goes back to 1860. And since then, lake levels have fluctuated anywhere from about 173 meters to about 175 meters. On this graph, the average annual lake level is shown by the blue dots, whereas the black bars represents the maximum and minimum level for each year. And once again, the red line is showing the 11-year moving average, trying to minimize some of the noise that's associated with the data. And ever since the 1980s, you can see that we have seen a fairly steady decrease in lake levels on Lake Erie. However, the lake levels that we're experiencing today, as you can see, are really not cl too close to the lower lake levels that we experienced in the 1930s. And looking at the record, you can see there was a fairly steady decrease from the late 1800s all the way through the 1930s. Between the 1930s and about the 1980s, there was a slight increase, and then today we are seeing that decreasing trend once again. Lake levels depend on a balance between precipitation and runoff, with evaporation off of the surface and outflow from the lakes. These complicated factors that go into lake dynamics makes it much more difficult when we're trying to determine how the lake levels might react to warming temperatures. For instance, will the increased temperatures lead to more evaporation and lower lake levels? Or will the increased precipitation make up for that increased evaporation and keep levels stable? Or is precipitation going to dominate and lake levels increase? So as you can see, there are a lot of factors that go into future projections for lake levels. And so it is fairly difficult to determine what might happen. However, let's take a look at some of the more recent studies that have tried to answer this question and see what they came to as far as the conclusion goes. So the first study is here in the top left, which is from Catherine Hayhoe in 2009. And this figure is showing a high emission scenario um, in all the Great Lakes basins. Uh, the Lake, Lake Erie projections are shown by the blue diamonds. And you can see that based on this study, it's expected that all lake levels are going to decrease by the end of the century. For Lake Erie in particular, by the end of the century, the projection is about a 0.4 meter change in mean lake level from today. Now, I did want to note that this study, when it looked at the low emission scenario, um, there really was not much change in lake levels from today. The second study is here on the right, which is from Angel and Kunkel in 2010. And this figure is showing lake levels for, for all the Great Lakes for the near future, which is the top mid-century, which is shown here in the middle, and then finally end-of-the-century projection is at the bottom. So let's focus in on Lake Erie, which is highlighted in the red box. So on this box and whiskers plot, the red line that we see here in the middle of these blue boxes represents the 50th percentile of all climate model projections. So as you can see, a majority of models are predicting slightly lower levels on Lake Erie um, in both in all near future, mid-century, and end of century projections. However, there are a slight percentage of the models that do predict lake levels could go up. So finally, the last study I wanted to point out was from Lofgren et al. in 2011. And this study found similar results to Angel and Kunkel, which we just looked at, where a majority of the models predicted lower lake levels. However, there was a slight chance with some of the models that we could see higher levels than today. So as I stated previously, there is still quite a bit of uncertainty as far as water levels go and what they might do in the future. So lastly, let's look at Lake Erie ice cover. 
So this figure is showing data since the early 1970s. And if you remember back to one of the first figures that I showed, temperatures have increased in this region since then. So it's not surprising that our ice cover has decreased over that same time period. The blue diamond on this graph represents the average annual ice cover in each individual year, and the red line is showing the moving average. So the green dots, which you can see at the top, represent the maximum ice cover extent for each year. So most years, um, maximum ice cover on Lake Erie is typically greater than 80 to 85 percent, with many years near 100 percent ice cover since it is a fairly shallow lake. However, one thing that's interesting is if you look at the last few decades, there's been over only four years where the maximum ice cover has been less than 25 percent, and those have all happened since 1998. And that's 1998, 2002, 2006, and 2012. So recently, we definitely have seen more years with less ice cover than we've seen over the last few decades. So what about the future? Well, as you might expect, since climate models are predicting warmer temperatures, they are also predicting that we'll see a decrease in ice cover. However, ice cover is also heavily influenced by natural patterns in the atmosphere that control our individual seasons and years. And these, are, these climate patterns are things like ENSO, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So ice cover will most likely be quite variable from year to year. However, it is possible that we'll see more frequent years with less ice cover than we are today. So with that, I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Stump. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Great presentation. We've gotten a few good questions, but I will save those until the end. If anyone still has questions, please remember that chat box on the right-hand side of your screen is there for you. Um, but for now, we will switch over to Dr. Stump from NOAA. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Christina. And thank you, Molly. That was, a, that was an excellent talk and a great setup for some of the things that I'll be talking about. Um, let's see. Uh, Christina, for clarity, for the um, laser pointer, mm -hmm. what do I click on? Um, the drop-down arrow next to the blue arrow on the left and side at the top. Got it. Okay. You can see it? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I'll be talking on harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie where we've been doing climate work. Um, but, of course, across the Great Lakes there may potentially be issues. Lake Erie, um, of course, became made a significant attention in 2011, which is the image on the back of the slide, when it had perhaps the worst bloom, most extensive bloom um, ever. Even some of the people who have been around the lake back in the 70s and early 80s say it may have exceeded those. So that certainly caused uh, considerable more attention on the lake. Um, what I'll touch on, go through here, the 2011 bloom. Um, Again, worst in decades, visible from space. And if we go to the following year, 2012, we didn't have much of a bloom. So there's obviously a considerable amount of variability between years, which becomes an important question as to um, what drives that and what that means from potentially from any climate variability, climate change impacts. Um, just to note, there are other places in the Great Lakes that have potential concern. Um, these images are of the um, uh, amount of um, uh, quantity of biomass in the water, and uh, Western Lake Erie shows up. This is 2008. Um, if it were cyanobacteria, there's a cell concentration. But you can see Saginaw Bay, which does have cyanobacteria blooms. Green Bay on the southern tip definitely has high biomass and occasional blooms. Lake Winnebago also happens to be rather visible in there. So these, there are other areas that um, have potential concerns around the Great Lakes. And I believe some of the people here are looking at those. We're starting, in our group, starting to examine some of these other regions, and we hope to get further along. But I'll concentrate on <coughs> Western Lake Erie. Can I just back to real quick? There's a few people asking um, you to speak just a little bit louder, please. OK. That, that sounds better. Thank that, you. That sounds better? OK. Um, we've been using uh, satellite data. Most of our time series for analyzing blooms has come from Maris, and <clears throat> the Maris is on a European has, was on a European uh, Space Agency satellite, MVSAT-1. Um, there was 
failed in uh, April 2012. We've been using a NASA MODA sensor as a substitute for two years, and we're looking forward to the replacement Sentinel-3. Uh, Maris measures uh, many wavelengths of light and, and visible and near-infrared, and you can see there's 1,100 kilometer wide swath collected about every other day. So when we get it, Lake Erie is picked up pretty much every other day as well as most of the Great Lakes. Um, just a slight bit of the science or physics here on what we're doing. Um, you maybe remember from physics the spectra. Um, blue light is in this wavelength, 400 to 500 nanometers. Green from 500 to 600, and red 600 to 700 nanometers. I'll say this will be the most technical slide you're going to see here today. Um, <clears throat> we're using, if, if anyone has dealt with ocean color data, in the open ocean, blue and green bands are used to identify chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, of course, absorbs blue light. So just like leaves or water, it becomes somewhat greener. And that works very well in the ocean where you don't have sediment or tannins or such in the water. When you're in Lake Erie, that does not work so well. And we're using red light. And because of the um, strong, <coughs> uh, because chlorophyll has a specific absorption right at this area, and phycocyanin actually has one here. We're able to use those to target these quite specifically, and we do not, we're not affected by sediment. That's usually the first question I get. Sediment doesn't influence us. <clears throat> um, the second question we usually get is how far into the water a satellite can see, and it's the rule of thumb for, is a secchi disk. Uh, those who know it, and if you don't, a secchi disk is a white disk about Oh, about a foot in diameter, you lower into water until you can't see it. So that's about how far in. Uh, cyanobacteria it happens. Microcystis likes to float up to the surface, and so it's kind of waving at the satellite as it goes by in the daytime. So that allows us to come up with this quantification. Um, as I say, more details on how we approach this. And to give you a better idea of what all this means with the red and infrared bands, here is what you might typically see, a true color image of the lake you might have pulled from a website. And if you squint, you say, well, there looks like there's greenish water here and there's some greenish water here, and some of that might be a bloom. Well, if we actually look in these other wavelengths, now we can see very clearly where the bloom is, this region here. Um, and if we go to the actual processing, the computations we use, not only do we pull those out, but it turns out Sandusky Bay was also full of cyanobacteria as well. And we use field data converting the cells per milliliter. The green here at 10 to the fifth cells per liter milliliter is a threshold that the World Health Organization has identified where there's a risk of, of potential toxins um, or the, a risk from the toxins, microcystin and so forth in the water. And that's usually the, the references that people have, um, many states work with. So that's what we end up using. And um, over the last uh, four, five years now, we've actually been producing a, a weekly bulletin during the bloom as to where it is and where it's likely to go. If you're interested in that, um, if you search in Google for the NOAA Lake Erie Bloom Bulletin, it should pop up in short order, and you can get the last bulletin, which we issued last week, which says it's finally gone for this year. Um, this happens to be from what we were putting out in September. So this imagery is actually allows us to build up the data set and the analyses to do climatologies. So from there, where have we gone with this? Well, we've taken the, the data and looked at the blooms over the last um, 11 years. This year will be the 12th year. And each year, we've taken the worst 30-day period, determined the extent of the bloom. And you can see the pattern each year. 2002 had almost nothing. 2003 had a noticeable bloom, mild in four, very little in five, something in six, mild in seven, and then a severe one in eight, nine, 10, the catastrophic one in 11, and then 12 had a somewhat more modest bloom overall. Because the motor sensor is, more, is much noisier than Maris, there's a lot of noise interference in here that we've not been able to reduce. Um, now, if we're trying to answer a question of how, trying to answer the climatological question, we'd like to actually convert this 
image into quantity. So we sum up, we add up all the concentrations in the western, in the region, the western Lake Erie, and we come up with a, a total index for each year from that sum of all those values, which you see here. <clears throat> we call that a CI, which is the index, the uh, cyano index. And you can see the pattern. Uh, for reference, uh, an index of one is about 10 to the 20th cells of microcystis. Um, as people often ask what it is, that's still a rather hard number to understand, but there's, that means there's cyanobacteria. You can see the variability going up to 2011, which was much bigger than any of the other years. <clears throat> now, um, talk a little bit about, let's, so we have you now with a, um, uh, an annual amount of cyanobacteria in Lake Erie. Let's talk a little bit about, about the climate side so we can bring back to the sorts of question, issues uh, Molly was talking on. Diatoms, which are uh, benign, um, they're the classic base of the food chain. Um, you can see like relatively cool temperatures, 10 degrees to 20 degrees, and then they become unhappy and um, pretty much they start, um, they stop growing if not dying. Cyanobacteria, on the other hand, definitely prefer temperatures above 20 degrees. They can do okay at 15. They do not like cold water, and they're very happy when it gets up to almost 30 degrees or more. So these are very clearly warm weather, um, warm water um, 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 a phytoplankton as compared to diatoms and many of the others. <clears throat> and if we look at Lake Erie, this is data from one of the NOAA buoys. Um, just uh, north between Sandusky and Cleveland at this location. That's actually a picture of it. Um, that's buoy 45005. And here's the climatology over 30 years. And I've drawn out against our patterns for cyanobacteria. They're not happy. It's too cold if it's below 15 degrees, which you can see is up into May and sometime in October. It's, they, can, they can do OK between 15 and 20, which is certainly in October and they really start growing above 20 degrees, which typically starts in June. This is the average, this is the standard deviation, and then that's the maximum range at the buoy. And <clears throat> of course, the best growth happens and the warmest, which is typically, there will be time periods in late July and August where it gets above 25 degrees. So that's clearly optimal for cyanobacteria during that time. Now. <clears throat> From the context that Molly had indicated um, with climate, some of the predictions were, um, I think, 3 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be a couple degrees centigrade. So you could essentially move all of these up, and we would end out with a longer period of time. September might routinely have temperatures that are optimal for growth, above 20 degrees. And October would have more in the pretty much most of October. To October might be above 15 degrees, which means they could continue to survive during that time. So that's one of the things to consider from a climate impact. Um, now, temperature itself does not necessarily, um, the question would be, does it determine how bad the bloom is during any year? What I just said was how long they will last. Well, if we look at the temperatures over the last 10 years when we had our, our data set, 2011, of course, was a severe bloom, and it was extremely warm in July. Um, but you'll notice that 2005 and 2006 were almost as warm in July, and certainly as warm in June and August, and yet they had very small blooms. Then in contrast, here we had 2008-9, which we had fairly large blooms, not as big as 11, but it was relatively cool. So the temperature itself is not enough to cause the variation between years. However, it's likely they will last longer um, when you have a longer season. Now, <clears throat> with cyanobacteria, one of the key factors driving cyanobacteria is the amount of phosphorus, the, the concentration. And the more phosphorus you get into the system, the greater risk that you're going to be dominated by cyanobacteria versus anything else. And this is a, a famous um, plot in the, in the field um, showing that pattern where you can see as the amount of phosphorus in the water increases, this is a log scale, the likelihood of cyanobacteria goes up, and it's pretty clear. Um, as you add more phosphorus, you hit a point where you're pretty much going to have cyanobacteria. Um, another component I should note with the temperature is um, diatoms sink 
and cyanobacteria can float. And so if you have a well-stratified or mixed water column, the cyanobacteria can then use the phosphorus that is simply not available to diatoms because they're all down at the bottom of, of the lake in those cases. So with the phosphorus, obvious question is phosphorus input. And so we're um, the Maumee River, which is um, largest tributary to Lake Erie, and I believe it's the largest tributary to any of the Great Lakes um, as a drainage basin drains into the western basin, which is pretty shallow, um, pretty much all less than 10 meters deep, um, a considerable difference from the other lakes. And obvious question is, what's the role of that on, with phosphorus? Well, we've been working with a group at Heidelberg University, um, Pete Richards, Dave Baker. They have a National Center for Water Quality Research, and they've, collected, they've developed an extraordinary data set of daily measurements of nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, at several Ohio rivers right near USGS gauging stations. This is a some 35, almost 40-year record of the Maumee River of nearly daily data. Um, we're only looking at the last 11 years, but that allows us to examine these these relationships with that data set. Um, there are a few trends that dissolve phosphorus concentration. Our load seems to have increased slightly in the last two years. Um, certainly part of that, um, but there's a lot of variability. Um, part of that, um, it's an interesting question. We think that might reflect some changes in farming practices as well as, of course, some of the, the precipitation and runoff that's occurred. Now, as a practical question, um, the total phosphorus load does follow the discharge. Here's the discharge in the Maumee River. Over the last several years, you can see it was a pattern that is, matches the phosphorus very closely. 2011, of course, was very high discharge because it was so wet, um, as Molly noted, and the phosphorus load was high, and 2012 was very dry and had very low discharge and very low phosphorus loads in the spring. Well, <clears throat> what we've determined is in comparing the summer bloom, the spring load is what actually drives the summer bloom. It's not, it, um, it takes, cyanobacteria are very slow growing. Um, they can take several days before they actually uh, double. They, um, they split and make more as compared to say diatoms, which can, can double several times in a day. And so um, it's not surprising that there would be a lag between the load of nutrients and the actual occurrence of a bloom. Again, the blooms are August, September, pretty much into October. We have a, we found a few models on this. One simple, <clears throat> practical one has to do with just the discharge, and that's that depends because phosphorus matches discharge, but also it, we believe that if you have high river discharge, the nutrients could spread over more of the the lake of the western basin, so there's more area for the uh, blooms to develop. And here's of course the relationship that we developed. Been working on some other models because we're trying to do um, predictions of um, the annual severity. And here's a different one using the dissolved phosphorus and discharge. And you can see also uh, this is a very good relationship, slightly different plotting system. So the spring, spring um, discharge and load is a key factor. And um, from a climate perspective, if you recall, the spring um, Precipitation is expected is model predictions that Molly indicated are potentially 5% or more increase. So you could picture every one of these gets bumped up a little bit um, as a result of that. We did do a seasonal forecast as a result of this in 2012. We predicted a mild bloom. Um, and um, this is how it came out. Our forecast, the model, that um, one of the key models and the actual results. Um, the forecast was right in the sense of a mild bloom, but clearly the model was underestimating 2012, um, which is an interesting question as to why that happened. And I, we should note 2012, it was unusual in several ways. Um, number one is it followed the worst bloom ever. And one possibility is there were so many nutrients in the system that they had not cleared by the following year. Um, so there was some residual. Remember, this is in October where we still have an extensive bloom in 2011. Um, and some indication that there may have been extra nutrients. 
there were some unusual blooms. Um, in Lake Erie, the Central Basin had a cyanobacteria bloom in early July. There was also a diatom bloom in early March that impacted several of these um, the water supply intakes in this region east of Cleveland. Uh, that had not previously occurred, so some indication there may have been additional nutrients left over. Um, as Molly noted, there was no ice or virtually no ice in 2012, which may keep the nutrients in the, in the system more. Um, but the ice, uh, there have been other years that have not had ice, and it's been a mixed bag. 1998, there was a bloom, uh, but in 2002 and 2006, there were pretty much no bloom in those particular years. So that's a little unclear as to that role. Um, and one other unusual climate, 2012, again, this is our uh, observations. There's, I marked the no ice years, 2002, 2006, and 2012. But there was also, it was also very wet in the winter um, in 2012, although 2007, which didn't have a bloom, was also wet. But there's a confluence of factors following the 2011 bloom, no ice, wet winter, all of which may potentially combine to have introduced more nutrients into the system um, that we, of course, need to look at. Um, in 2013, um, this is how the, we clearly had a change to uh, a wetter year. Um, this is the discharge, the dissolved phosphorus, and total phosphorus load. And in fact, we made a prediction this year for a bloom that would be significant, at least at least equivalent to 2003 bloom, um, and definitely worse than last year. And um, that's driven by, again, that variability in precipitation especially. Um, as of right now, uh, we're in the process of evaluating the bloom, but I can show you what it looked like on September 10th. And while it was a problem this year, it was definitely nowhere near what it was in 2011. We had estimated it wouldn't be more than one fifth of 2011 in severity, and that's going to be correct. And we'll have to we'll be calculating the severity of the bloom this winter as to how that compares. But we can see where it was this year. From a, a climate pattern point of view, um, since we can estimate bloom severity, um, that means we can examine the relationships of, of discharge and precipitation and temperature on how severe the bloom is each year and even how extensive it is um, because of the, um, the nature of the satellite data. And so that allows us to include the models of impacts. We can include scenarios if uh, the rainfall increases or um, at, at some amount we could um, do those kind of calculations and estimate them. Of course, we have to assume certain other things don't change. If there's a new invasive species, and um, hopefully we don't get another quagga or zebra mussel, um, but some of those factors can change. Spring load matters. Um, that's a runoff discharge issue. And, um, and it's also possible that the severity of the impacts can produce more runoff and more nutrient runoff as well. So the scenario Molly presented of um, more intense rainfall events could possibly alter the amount of nutrients that are coming in for a particular um, amount of rainfall. The amount of the, the loading very much is um, sensitive to rainfall events. There's not a steady flow of, of nutrients and water going into the. It's very spiky as a result of these, and that timing does matter. So the fact that it'll be wetter. Um, in, in spring is, is potential. Uh, temperature, um, and that's a factor for blooms. While it doesn't drive the dry size of the blooms yet, it's quite likely that uh, having longer hot periods can lead to longer blooms. This past year, uh, this year, uh, this fall, we saw 15 degrees, um, we did not see 15 degrees centigrade water temperatures until just about the last week in October and the bloom persisted until then, until the last week in October. So one possibility is if we do have them, they could last much later in the year than we get right now. So those are, those are some of the key factors that, that could actually drive this from a point of view of a climate change. Um, 
overall, if we if we plan for that that change in variability, um, that w that potentially can be built into some of the um, management strategies. Key key sources of phosphorus, of course, are are um, from agricultural lands. The Maumee River Basin is, I believe, it's like 85 percent or more um, agriculture. And so, um, knowing that we might be dealing with different types of, of runoff scenarios or different temperatures in the winter could help address those the, the planning for the best strategy to reduce the spring loads. We do that. We should have water that looks like in this picture for much more through the year. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stump. That was a really, really interesting presentation. And we've gotten some good questions as well. Um, and thank you, Molly, of course, as well. Um, I will start with a few questions that came up during Molly's presentation, but of course, um, if the other person has a comment, please feel free to jump in as well. Um, Molly, someone was asking about um, how the time period for moving trends is chosen, the 11-year moving average. Yeah, so the 11 year moving average, um, you know, typically about 10 years is used, but really the only reason that 11 years is used instead is because um, on plotting graphs, it makes it a little bit easier because that's centered on a year as opposed to falling between two years. So, really, that's the only difference between choosing the 11 year over a 10 year average. Okay. Um, some people were asking about including data and modeling from the Canadian side, particularly of Lake Erie, but all of the Great Lakes. Do you, mm -hmm. um, I know the Midwest Regional Climate Center, of course, is concerned with the U.S. side, but do you guys work with a Canadian office as well? You know, we, we don't do any of the projections, um, so we don't have that data. I just was using studies. Um, but as far as the U.S. or the data side of it goes, historical data, I know there is some Canadian data, but it's really not, it doesn't overlap too much. We don't really use it um, too much in our studies. So we have worked a little bit when we've been producing the Great Lakes um, two-pager with uh, that NOAA does, where we are working with Canadian offices. That's more of a short-term short climate impacts um, that we are working with Environment Canada up there. Okay. Um, someone asked why 1970 is the deciding split here. This was on the heavy precipitation slide where you compared Sandusky and um, Erie, Pennsylvania. Why is that yeah. 1970? Yeah, that's, um, sometimes it's a little bit hard to determine the changing point, but a lot of times 1970 is kind of used as when we started to see more trends, whether it's increasing temperature or increasing precipitation. Um, so that's that's kind of the reason for choosing 1970. The other way that you could do it, which actually I did do the analysis, is just, is just choosing half of the period of record for that station, and it pretty much gives the same result. So, you know, sometimes using that, um, that method, it's difficult to choose exactly what year is kind of your changing point. Um, you know, so I went with the 1970, which is kind of where you do start to see um, throughout the United States, we started to see more changes. Okay. Um, and someone would wanted to know how average annual lake level is measured. How is that determined? You know, I that data that I got for the average annual lake level is from GLORAL, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. Um, so I. I'm not, I don't want to answer that just in case I answer it incorrectly, um, but I would guess it's just that they, they measure it daily and that they average it over the year, but once again, I would not want to take that as fact without checking with Glural. Okay. And the person, to the person that asked that question, the people at Glural are very good about taking questions from the public, so if you search online for NOAA Glural, G-L-E-R-L, um, I'm sure there's a contact there for you to answer that question. Um, we'll move on to some of the questions that came during Dr. Stump's presentation. Um, someone was asking, how accurate thus far has the Maris imagery and the um, algorithm been in determining where microsurface blooms are? 
and how confident you are in that product? Uh, so far, our um, when we've identified areas where there's a cyanobacteria in Lake Erie, we have not found that we have been mistaken um, during um, this time of year. Um, so I would say yes, we're quite accurate. We are continue we continually evaluate the concentrations that we measure from satellite against field data. We just finished a rather extensive data season this year, and so um, we'll be reviewing those for how accurate the concentrations are. Um, we did evaluate, um, we tried a couple of different methods to evaluate the um, uh, the annual for a, a sensitivity um, and to how we calculate the annual severity and found we were less than 10% um, variability. Um, at least from an internal point of view. So our precision seems to be very good. So we are very confident in this. And our, we've, our feedback also from the people we work with with bulletins um, indicates that we are getting it right. <laughs> A little vague, but it's, it's, some of this gets very hard to evaluate because there's, um, um, we keep having to collect more data to do that. Okay. Someone was asking about, in addition to the river loading from the Maumee and other tributaries, what about the resuspension of phosphorus from open lake disposal? Could that practice exacerbate the bloom? Uh, it's possible that open lake um, disposals could have a very local effect, um, which there's any number of intense local effects you can get from, from disposing of dredge material. From an overall um, larger perspective of the bloom severity, um, they, any of the, the other effects are pretty much dwarfed by the, the, the loadings that are coming from the Maumee River. They're completely dwarfed. Okay. Um, one question. The 2013 bloom was described by um, Dr. Tom Bridgman of the University of Toledo as the second worst for open water behind the 2011 bloom. Does that mean it's the second worst overall, as in ever? Uh, I'll let you know once we finished our computations. <laughs> uh, I work I work with Tom Tom Bridgman on. We've intercompare numbers, and we'll have to review that. We we do. I will say he work. We work in slightly different areas. He's he has excellent data for the open water in the western part of the western basin, and uh, we cover a larger area. So we're comparing in some ways apples and oranges, okay. um, or maybe apples and um, watermelons, <laughs> and so he might be correct for that part of the basin. Um, but it, that doesn't mean it was the most extensive part. But to having to say that, until we work up our numbers, I can't really answer how they compare. Uh, stay tuned. Before uh, we hope to have them done this winter, and we certainly will before we do a forecast um, on, for next summer. Um, for the uh, weekly HABS bulletins. What is there, are there, or are there plans for any of the other Great Lakes to have similar products from NOAA? Uh, if there's enough of a uh, demand for that, yes, we can do that. So, so uh, people ask for those. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's 250 people here. Um, if you feel there's a need for it, you need to uh, uh, express your views. Uh, right now, we are certainly looking at the, from a practical side, we're able to process the other areas. We're starting to look at them. Um, I'm, we're rather thin on data for some of the other areas, like Green Bay and Saginaw Bay, in order to figure out what we're doing. But we're certainly, we're in a position to do that. Um, not in the next year, but certainly a couple of years out. But part of that is defining priorities. As always, with funded work. <laughs>
Um, sorry, just looking through some of the other questions. Um, is there any tracking of other algae blooms in Lake Erie aside from the diatoms and microcystis that you mentioned? The question specifically asks about chlorophyta. Um, we have run across some uh, chlorophyte blooms. Um, I, maybe the questioner is getting at determining the total amount of biomass in the lake, and we're starting to think in terms of just how much algae there is in the lake. Um, we've just we're in the process of just completing um, a full year-round data set for the lake, excluding, of course, ice cover, um, to start getting at that question. So. Um, I'm hoping we'll start being able to pull out patterns for spring, which is when you see the diatom and chlorophyte blooms, especially. So we're working towards that. Don't have an answer yet. All right. Um, as far as historical data on algal blooms, how far back in time does that information go? Uh, well, there's all... The satellite record that we have is 2002. There are satellite data going back further, um, but it gets much harder to quantify. Um, I actually worked on a 95, the 95 bloom, which was the first one since the early 80s. But um, and if you look, though, there are um, EPA's uh, monitoring program has um, tried to. They've sampled in spring and summer seasonally, going back decades. And there's a few other programs that have done so that have give some uh, assessment of the, the state of the lake. So I, I would suggest certainly starting with the EPA um, Great Lakes program data sets because you will find those. But they're clearly um, much thinner because it's only a few samples of, and a few you know per season. Um, but they, those records do go back much further. We'll do one last question before we wrap up. Um, are nutrients that are sequestered by the blooms potentially important in subsequent bloom formation as they are re-released back into the water column? Uh, the blooms, um, well, there's, there's probably a few parts to the blooms. Certainly these blooms are a factor um, and, and formation of hypoxia in the central lake, low oxygen areas in um, the central part of Lake Erie. And so having smaller algal blooms means that it's likely that both of all types, cyanobacteria, chlorophytes, diatoms, would potentially mean um, less um, low oxygen in the central basin. As far as a source of, of nutrients, um, there's the nutrients do ultimately end out in the sediments, um, but the nutrient recycling coming back out of the sediments doesn't seem to be the key part in at least driving these blooms. It's, a, it's an interesting question of whether, though, it drives spring blooms because you have very vigorous mixing and wave action. So um, that's one of the questions we wondered when, for example, in spring 2012, there was a massive diatom bloom in areas close where they don't normally occur, but near where the cyanobacteria showed up in 2011. So one suspicion is those nutrients did last to create a spring bloom. And that's something that that's a consideration we need to think about. All right, we'll have to wrap up for today. We'll try to address some of the other questions that we've gotten um, via our website, and we'll let everyone know um, once those become available with responses. Um, I wanted to again thank Molly and Rick for their willingness to talk to us today about their climate work, a really great presentation, some really good questions. Um, also, a thank you to NOAA, the National Sea Grant College Program, um, the Ohio State University, and other partners for funding this webinar. Um, I did want to remind you that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. If you're having problems for some reason with that URL, take off the period at the end of it. Um, and I posted a new version of that link just a few moments ago. Please take a few minutes to fill out that survey.
Um, I also want to refer you to resources and an archive of all previous webinar presentations, which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website, and as well as our new regional climate site, which is at greatlakesclimate, all one word, dot com. This webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue on Thursday, December 12th with a presentation from OSU economist Brent Sanjin and the Nature Conservancy's Bill Stanley about the Ohio Wedges Project. Registration is up in the chat feature and we'll also email that to you after the webinar. So feel free to register now for the December webinar. Thank you again to Molly Willowson and Rick Stump and all participants on this webinar. We hope it was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you for coming and have a great afternoon, everyone.